Ivy Nation Sports Talk, welcome to the show. Glad to have you with us here today, along with Jesse Styers. I'm Sean Styers, and um, I was just doing my talking Jesse <laughs> off the Cowboys ledge before we started, and uh, people were asking about you yesterday, Jess, uh, how you were doing after <laughs> after Sunday night. Do you want to I just turned my phone off? I just. Vitals? I, I turned my phone off after the game. I didn't want to be bothered. I knew it would only make me more upset. So I didn't interact or start ta- thinking about the Cowboys again until yesterday after I got done uh, with work. So, yeah, I just, you know, the best thing for me was to just turn my phone off and separate, decompress for the rest of the evening. Salty's Not think about for, it. Salty's looking for a way to pipe funeral music <laughs> into the show for you. Oh, I've got a feeling that rapid fire, we, you know, I, I, we saved the Cowboys stuff for later in rapid fire today. I told everybody yesterday, and I think it was Salty who was asking, you know, if we wanted to talk about Cowboys, Niners, and, and Bengals, and Bills, and, and all that. And I said, well, I'm saving it for when Jesse shows up tomorrow, because I know there's going to be a lot of it. I can see you're still happy. <laughs> I'll agree with you on this because, you know, like you were just talking, I'll just, let's say this off the top. It's, you know, similar to Notre Dame. Like when Notre Dame loses a college football playoff game by a couple of touchdowns, it's the end of the world. Whereas other teams, you know, like the the last few years, whether it's Alabama or Clemson or whoever the dominant team was, LSU a few years back, everybody, everybody was losing lopsided College football playoff games, national championship and semifinal to those teams. But when it happens to Notre Dame, it's all about, well, Notre Dame doesn't belong here, all this different stuff. You don't hear that same stuff with these other teams when they get beat in some of those lopsided games. And it's the same with the Cowboys right now. Just look at TV. You know, the world is acting like like the Cowboys have never lost a game. And I was just telling you, like, the bigger disappointment and the bigger flop is Josh Allen and the Buffalo Bills, but no one's talking about that right now. The whole world is just enveloped in, oh, is is Dak Prescott the guy? Dak Prescott's a loser and all this different stuff. And I'm not going to give it Dak a free pass, but things get inflated when they are certain teams, you know, Cowboys, Notre Dame, Yankees, Red Sox, whoever yeah, they that's... have to be. That's where I get frustrated because all my friends are text me like, well, this is this is why, because Cowboy fans are annoying. It's like, I'm just a Cowboy fan. I'm not the obnoxious, over-the-top Cowboys fan that you see, you know, like these people on TikTok and Twitter and stuff. Like, I, I just want to be treated like a normal fan. Like, I don't, I don't, I know. Good luck with that. I Good know. And that's that. why, that's why it's hard because, you know, again, it, how it's. The, how'd your parlay? How'd your parlay turn out? Um, I had one that really the one that hurt the most is I had like eight legs and Tony Pollard needed 25 yards and he got hurt at 23 yards in the first half. So that one really sucked. Um, after divisional round, I am seven and three on playoff predictions. I'll take that. That's you know, I'm still winning, but uh money line parlay did not go well this past weekend. <laughs> no. All right. Well, I tell you what. Again, we'll save we'll save NFL talk for rapid fire. Of course, we have some Notre Dame topics as always in rapid fire, but we've got a bigger topic to talk about today. And it looked like we kind of confused some people. If you would, as we get started, smash that like button. We do appreciate it, and uh, you know it helps out the Irish Breakdown channel as we always like to say. Subscribe, rate, review, comment, leave a five star review on on apple or you know wherever you happen to uh to get your podcast we do appreciate it and it helps us out greatly but hit the uh like button tonight on youtube while you're here so last summer i think i might have confused some people with the title of this show based on a couple of different comments last summer i wrote about and we talked here on this show about former nfl executive bill polian and his 11 guidelines for selecting 
a successful football coach. Of course, Polian, this is Brian's father, Brian Polian, former Notre Dame special teams coordinator who's now down at LSU. His father, Bill, Pro Football Hall of Famer. He was the architect of the Buffalo Bills great teams of the early 90s. He hired Marv Levy in Buffalo, uh, later hired Tony Dungy when he was in Indianapolis with the Colts. And Bill Polian, he's he's written two books. He's got a chapter in one of his books titled Deciding on the Decision Maker. And so Polian has these 11 standards he uses uh, when he's evaluating a potential head coach. And again, we applied him to Marcus Freeman last summer before the season started and kind of said, okay, what might this look like for Marcus Freeman? Does he fit this bill You know that, that Polian is talking about? Polian says, hiring the right head coach is the most important piece to building a successful football team. Get it right and you have a good chance of being successful for a long time. Get it wrong. You'll likely find yourself going backward in a hurry. It'll cost you two things. You never get back time and money. So that's kind of the nutshell of where we're going with this today. Are you excited about this today, Jess? Are you ready to do this? What do you think about this whole exercise we're about to get into? I think this is a great exercise. And I, I again, it breaks down all aspects of what it means to be, you know, a head coach. And I think that there are very uh, important pillars that will be outlined here, and it should be fun to talk about each of them. Yeah, and I mean, this summer, again, we did it before the season started, and we went through this point by point, all 11 points. I felt like Marcus Freeman fit most of these pretty well, but now we have some more tangible product to look at, some more tangible material that we see from Marcus Freeman's actual first year of being a head football coach. That's what we didn't have when we did this going in. We didn't know what he would look like as a head coach. Well, now we do. We have a full season of it. So number one standard Bill Polian talks about is organization. Polian said it ranges from how he organizes the playbook to his practice plans, year-round staff assignments, uh, to his off-season programs. And he says each of those areas and many more must be laid out in writing, explained completely step-by-step, step, especially when a candidate who's never been a head coach before. So Jess, what do you think about how Marcus Freeman held up to standard number one organization? Yeah, um, I, I in, in terms of organization, I thought that the team always seemed organized. I thought that the, the coordinators seemed organized um, and, and the game flow seemed organized. You know, I, I'm not sure between, you know, practice plans and playbook. Like, obviously, you know, I don't see any of those things. But when we're talking about just purely being organized, I don't see any disorganization out of someone like Marcus Freeman on a, you know, on a, on a game to game basis, because really that's ultimately all I see, right? Like I don't see practices. I don't see the playbooks. I don't see what he's handing out to his players and stuff. Well, like that's that. what most of us see. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a great point. Like we don't get to see behind the curtain. The closest thing to behind the curtain is when we get to go to a few practices and stuff like that. Right. So then you, you kind of look at, to me, what you look at organizationally wise on game days is are your, you know, are your staff in the right places? Do you have your guys up in the press box in the right places? Do you have your personnel groups on the sidelines in the right places? Are you subbing guys in and out efficiently and effectively? Um, do you have, you know, do you have your second defensive line unit waiting? Do you have your wide receivers, you know, waiting to switch out and come in based on personnel settings? And we never saw issues with that or delays in that. Right. Notre Dame wasn't running guys onto the field last second. Notre Dame didn't take delay of game penalties. Notre Dame didn't, you know, execute poorly out of their out of their sets and stuff like that. So for me, I think he's, you know, I, I don't have anything negative to say about his organization in terms of what I can see based on kind of the things I just laid out there. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, getting to see some of the practices, even though it's a different coach, there was always a practice plan in place, which is what you would expect. They go from one station to the next efficiently, and all the coaches knew what they were supposed to do. And my thought in the summer on this was kind of what you were talking about. Like when you we had the blue gold game to kind of hold as a as a test run for a game. And obviously we had the Fiesta Bowl, but again, that was a little bit different when you've got like three and a half weeks or whatever to prepare for it. But you didn't see any mass confusion in the blue gold game with the stuff you were talking about sub packages and guys getting on and off the field. Like guys knew where they were supposed to be and what units they were supposed to be on. And we saw an extension of that going into the season. And I think you can kind of add 
like recruiting to this a little bit as well because like they're crisscrossing the country and they're always coming and going and there's a lot obviously going on there and planning the weekends and stuff like that now not all of that of course is on the head coach even though he is a much bigger factor in recruiting than the previous head coach but he's got a guy like Chad Bowden you know who who handles the majority of that but it's also knowing the right guy to have in charge so I, I think that uh from everything that we've seen, he seemed to pass the organization standard with flying colors, I guess is what I'd say. So number two standard that Bill Polian has for his head coaches when he's hiring a head coach, leadership. And this is, you know, it's like leadership coaching. Like if you want a good head coach, leadership, they kind of go hand in hand. Get what, Before we go on to that, Michael says he may have been too organized interesting and you know like maybe did some things need to be looser <laughs> you know like adjust on the fly yeah as for plan of action you know being able to be able to adjust and i think that uh that's kind of in part one of the standards that we have coming up a little bit later so save your thoughts on that but for leadership polian says does he have the philosophical approach verbal skills physical presence, stability, and courage to lead and motivate the coaching staff, the players, and the support staff. So what do you think of that one, Jess? Um, I actually think that <clears throat> Marcus Freeman is one of the best leaders that Notre Dame has uh, had over the past, you know, coaches, players, um, all of it. I think that Marcus Freeman is a tremendous leader. Um, and 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 for some of the reasons that Polian, you know, outlined and what it means to be the leadership role is, you know, his, he has excellent verbal skills. There are no, I don't, to me, at least from what I've heard, what I've seen in press conferences, comments that he's made, there is no ambiguity to, you know, what needs to happen in order to get better, in order, you know, to potentially his, how, where things stand uh, with his players. I think there's also, you know, there's always some sort of good skills in terms of communication and the physical presence of just being up there and being the guy who's going to take the brunt of the comments um, and not, you know, not allowing his players to kind of have to take the fall um, for a lot of things. So I do really like Marcus Freeman as, as a leader because of his courage. I like the way that he motivates his players and coaching staff. Um, and again, I, I just think that he is just really good with his words. I, I think that he is, he reminds me a lot of someone like um, the rhetoric that like someone like Barack Obama used to use uh and you know whether you liked him or not i thought that mr obama had a very good way of being able to talk and be able to uh careful you know, you're rhetoric. bringing politics into this show there's a no <laughs> politics fly zone on this show it's just, so. not, it's just rhetoric i the, the way that you talk to people is rhetoric and i like he's succinct I like is his what rhetoric. you're saying he's succinct and yeah yeah um how would he compare how would marcus freeman compare to maybe some coaches that you've had along these lines with all the stuff that you've been talking about would you put him head and shoulders <laughs> over most of the coaches you've had yeah i would especially it, at the college level um i felt that i had some coaches who um wanted certain things but didn't lead in a way that would produce kind of what they were looking for if that makes sense because I think you have to lead in a way, uh, and and it's one thing to kind of you know say some things, um, but you have to lead in a way that shows that you want to back up the things that you're saying. And I think Marcus Freeman does a tremendous job of that. And I've not always um, experienced that same thing. Okay, interesting. And I, I, as it applies to Marcus Freeman, I mean, from the get go, we've seen that he's the point man. In recruiting, you know, like if you if you start with there, because that is obviously the foundation of Marcus Freeman. It's it starts with his recruiting and you know some other things that go into the recruiting. But like from the time from the minute he took over, he was holding these daily staff meetings, hanging out with the grad assistants, you know that kind of stuff. Make it a point to be in the quarterback room with those guys, and you know he let his assistants do their jobs rather than micromanaging. The assistance now again you know like to michael's point that he was talking about maybe you know there is you know some th there's kind of a learning curve potentially and maybe how much he needs to you know not necessarily take over but 
inject or insert himself into uh certain things so those are those good nuts or like what are you what are you munching on over there <laughs> just some popcorn i haven't i didn't get the chance to eat lunch today so i'm, I'm pretty okay. hungry great so but he also you know never shifted blame never pointed fingers and i think that's a big part of leadership at either players or assistants when things went wrong so i think that's that, that that's a big thing and again everything we've seen points to you know really big check mark on the leadership front standard number three per bill polian is communication and what polian said can he teach or is he a lecturer a teacher gets everyone involved he's able to illustrate his lessons with real life examples sometimes funny parables gets his students invested in what he's teaching a lecture just stands at the podium and Again, this might be tougher to gauge from the outside, but you know, can you think of anything you know maybe that that applies to this from what we've been able to witness? Yeah, and I, I honestly wish that Marcus Freeman kind of took over more during the season in some of those games where they struggled and communicated with his players and potentially changed some things. Uh, you know, took charge. A little bit more because I I don't think he wanted to kind of step on toes of his coordinators, but I think there's times where you as a head coach can step in as a teaching moment and communicate with your team because of the experience and the knowledge that you have. And an example that comes to mind was actually in the South Carolina bowl game when Prince Kali came off the field and you could see uh, he was having a, some sort of conversation with Prince Kali after he made a mistake in either setting the strength or not being lined up formationally. Correct. Right. And I thought that that was a tremendous example of how he was able to communicate with a player in live time and kind of fix or adjust, you know, what the problem was at hand. And it didn't seem like he was blowing up on Prince Kali. He wasn't screaming in his face. He wasn't purple in the face. It just seemed like he was having a just a conversation with him and trying to, you know, let him know how he can fix whatever his mistake was. So, that's what I would like to, it, it, you know, I don't think that that's just something that Marcus Freeman does in a one-off. I'm sure that that is, you know, a reoccurring theme and practices maybe on the sidelines more than, you know, more so than we know. So in terms of communication from a limited view, I would say that Marcus, again, this is something that Marcus Freeman is good at, but I'd almost like to see a little bit more of it uh, kind of going forward. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I think, if you kind of get to the core of why Marcus Freeman is has been a successful coach, you know, to whatever degree so far, and why he's come up the ranks so quickly, I mean, he's a great recruiter, and he ultimately became a 36-year-old first-time head coach at Notre Dame, and it all starts with his communication skills, I think, his ability to relate to people and that kind of stuff. He relates to people, connects with them. You know, like thinking back, I mean, this has been a while now, at this point, this has been, I can't even remember exactly when it was now. I mean, it was in his Freeman's first year, but uh, Braylon James, the wide receiver from Texas, when he committed to Notre Dame, I guess it's been like last spring, I think, you know, one of the first things that he talked about when, when you know, it was like, why did you commit to Notre Dame? He talked about Freeman just spending time with him, getting to know him, that, you know, that kind of stuff. And like, there was that video Again, of like when C.J. Carr, back before he had committed, when he was visiting and he was camping at Notre Dame, you know, he's out there with C.J. Carr and, you know, he's, you know, he's joking around with him and stuff like that. So, you know, I think that, you know, again, uh, I'm not just applying it to recruiting, but it's a big part of recruiting, the ability to communicate. And it seems like, you know, like, Again, like there was communication with Drew Pine, for example, and Tyler Buckner about here's what's going on at quarterback as soon as the season ended. And Drew Pine, you know, that they communicated, I, I assume, in as respectful a way as possible. And Drew Pine didn't like it. He left. You know, Tyler Buckner is still here. But they they told him, hey, you know, we're we're looking at the transfer portal. They and, and you know, like in Pine's case, like you know, we're looking at potentially Tyler Buckner to to play in the bowl game or, or start in the bowl game. So they were up front. Sometimes the communication isn't always what you want to hear, but it's still there. They let them make their decisions, and that's what they ultimately did. So I've got to think, again, it starts in the recruiting process, and we've seen 
just a lot of of good examples of that i think along the way yeah those are two aspects i didn't really think of but definitely agree on is you know if you're landing these these big recruits there's obviously got to be good communication between you the head coach and the primary recruiting coordinator um and these you know big time recruits that you're going after and again like you talked about with the transfer portal now open um and being you know as large as it is these days um there's got to be communication with players you know where they stand uh you know like like someone like drew pine and just the upfront honest communication and so then both sides can make their you know make a, a decision that is in their best interest so I do think that communication is one of Marcus Freeman's, you know, better attributes uh, overall. Yep. So standard number four that Bill Polian laid out is emotional stability. Can he function well under pressure from players, staff, ownership, fans, and the press is what Bill Polian says. And like, just based on one year, like it is night and day different from one coach to the next what do you think yeah i i i do think that uh in terms of the 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 previous coach that there is more emotional or i should say better emotional stability or more mature emotional um stability but you know in terms of what we were talking about can he functional under pressure uh from players staff ownership fans and press I do think so because you never see Marcus Streeman lose his cool in press conferences after the games, after the tough losses, you know, like the Stanford and the Marshall. And he's not getting mad at people asking him questions or kind of firing back, you know, quick, witty comments at anyone. He just takes them and gives you, you know, the best the best answer possible. Um, and, and there's no more. Like I said, this kind of played into what I was talking about um, on the last one is. He, th there was no when, when guys make mistakes, there was no getting blue or purple in the face and right just exactly screaming at them for everyone to see, knowing and that everyone can see it. This is something that we had no idea before the season started how he was going to handle this, because, again, like going from assistant coach to head coach, there's a completely different level of expectation on you. So, like, maybe you can, you know hide some things, especially publicly when you're an assistant coach, that they come out like, you know, when you become the head coach. And, you know, it was it was all pretty much honeymoon phase until Ohio State and Marshall back to back, and obviously especially Marshall. But like you said, unlike his predecessor, he didn't lash out when he started getting a few hard kept questions in the press conferences and the lights get a little bit brighter and the expectations ratchet up even more because now you've lost to Marshall in your third game. You started your, your career 0-3, but, you know, like you said, he never climbed down people's throats, never yelled at guys, you know, making mistakes coming off the field and all that stuff. Now, there are some people who wanted to see more from Marcus Freeman emotionally on the sidelines, but, you know, as, as someone who wished he could have controlled things a little bit better himself sometimes – as a coach, like I would say, like I appreciate Marcus Freeman's calm demeanor because he's still, you know, he's got some emotion of his own just in a different way, you know, and like every coach has a different style. Tony Dungy, Andy Reid, Bill Walsh, Tom Landry, they all had more cerebral demeanors, not prone to emotional outbursts and stuff like that. And just because you're not showing emotion on the sideline, doesn't mean you're not into things doesn't mean you're not doing your job you know whether it's motivationally or or whatever else there are a lot of things that have to be processed and and i think every guy who stands on the sideline and wears that head coaching hat is going to do things in a different way marcus freeman has his own way and you know yeah like like michael said he's calm but he has fire when it's needed as well like we've seen him at practice chew on some guys in practice you know so I think he's got a really good balance. You know, I think that like emotional stability, again, is like one of his key attributes uh, along with the communication and the leadership. Yeah. And I, I think it says something to kind of what Michael Johnson was talking about. He is calm, but we don't see that fire. And I, I'm assuming that that fire comes out, you know, like I've seen some of those post game um 
you know, like when the, the Notre Dame football Twitter posts videos of them getting fired up and hyped up after the win and all that stuff, you know, I imagine those things go on, but Marcus Freeman is calm when he's needed to be, because I don't know about you, but when your coach is kind of freaking out or, you know, getting all fired up on the sidelines, it kind of provides some sort of instability yourself as a player. You feel kind of like not really secure or as sure in, in your, in what you, you know, you've been practicing at. If you see your head coach kind of, you know, getting out of line or kind of too fired up or too emotional. Right. So I, I do like to believe that he is calm when he needs to be, but then it is also kind of fired up, you know, maybe behind the scenes when we not, we don't necessarily see everything. Yes. Very true. Little, little interlude here. Salty says, um, I worry about the specter of domestic violence after such a loss. Has anyone seen the dog that used to run around in Jesse's background? Where is Henry these days? He, Salty is right. I don't think I've seen Henry for he's a little right. while. He's blending in on that. I'm trying to point to him on the end of that blanket over there. I can kind of so so he's just chilling on that blanket back there. Yeah, you could probably be able to see his little ears popped up. The blanket's white and he's white, so I can kind of see him back there. I can <laughs> All right. And and uh, Tommy, who's changed his handle to not Ryan's bully, says if Mr. Steyer's doctor is watching and reading the chat, just wanted to say thank you for the case, for the care you provided to him personally at his family. At his <laughs> well, thank you, Tommy. That's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. <laughs> I do appreciate you saying that. And I'll be seeing Dr. Turk next week, a week from today, as a matter of fact. So. All right, so there's a little mid uh, mid standard interlude. So on with more of Bill Polian's standards for hiring a head coach. Vision is the next one. It is standard number five. He says it's the most important quality of them all. Does he have a clear picture of how he wants the team to look and play? Can he articulate it verbally and in writing? And now he had what he called his gold standard when he was introduced as head coach. It was like challenge everything unit strength, right, competitive right, right, right. spirit, you know, like those things. And then he's also talked throughout the course of this season about how he wants an offensive and defensive driven line program. So it seems like his vision, you know, is, is pretty solid. It's, it's been pretty consistent. I think, what do you think about that? Yeah. And you beat me to kind of the punch on some of these things. The first thing that he did at his introduction press conference was talk about the golden standard and lay out his vision for how he wants the program to rerun, the players that he's looking for, and the expectations that he is looking to get out of his players. Um, and then again, he talked about you know the way his team is going to be run. He wants to be a team that is physical. He wants to control you know the, the trenches on both sides of the ball, and he wants to establish you know a punch you in the mouth kind of run game. And let things kind of feed off of, um, you know, feed off, feed off of that. I will say my only knock on the vision is sometimes the vision needs to be tweaked depending on what's going on in the moment. And right. I think that is the deficiency to Marcus Freeman's vision is he can't get too caught up in the vision. Right. But there's also, I'll, I'll you know, spoiler alert. One of the uh, one one of the other um, standards is flexibility. And that's coming up in a little bit. So we will kind of address that when we get to flexibility. But I agree, like, there was some adjusting that went along. So maybe the vision is one thing. But again, I, I think he didn't get too locked in on saying this is what it is. This is what it's going to be. He was still willing to adjust. But again, we'll touch on that in flexibility. The next standard, though, is strategy. This is kind of an interesting one to me. I'll be really curious to kind of see um, what some of our listeners think about Marcus Freeman's strategy during the season. Is he mentally prepared to make decisions on the sideline or does he react, Polian said? Does he have direct responsibility for key st strategic decisions? In other words, is he the guy making them or is he going to lean on somebody else? He's got to be the one to decide whether to go for it on fourth and goal. So... How would you apply this, the strategy aspect, to what we saw from Marcus Freeman in season one? You know, I think that he's that guy that's going to make that final decision, you know, those ultimate decisions of are we punting the ball? Are we going for two? 
Are we going for it on fourth and one? You know, those type of decisions. I have no doubt that he takes charge and makes those decisions. I think the thing that I would put into question is the part, is he mentally prepared to make decisions on the sideline or does he react? And I think that sometimes he could be better at being prepared for adversities that potentially are going to arise and how he's going to respond to them. Cause it felt like early on in the season, he was more reactionary rather than kind of leading the charge and being ready for maybe some obstacles that came his way. And I think that again is like the natural learning process of becoming a head coach where you have to realize you're the one who has to make those decisions now. And I think that as the season went on, we saw some more of that, you know, because like, again, it's the biggest difference between being a head coach and a coordinator or you're the one who has to make these decisions now. Like you can ask for input if you want, even though you don't have much input and there's really not even that much time to ask for input. But, you know, like his two biggest decisions before this season, but, you know, go back to the Fiesta Bowl last year when he decided not to try to score at the end of the first half and then going for it on fourth down in their own territory late in the game. You know, there were there were no real major decisions that backfired during the season. They were solid on fourth down, like seven of 16 on fourth down. You know, like there was the fourth down play against Stanford that didn't work. Remember the run by Jaden Thomas that they tried on the end around or the jet sweep or whatever you want to call it. And the decision itself to go wasn't bad. I think what most of us took exception with with the play call, and that goes more on who's calling the plays than deciding whether or not to go for it on fourth down. And, you know, like you had the fourth down, fourth and one, against BYU that got stuffed like remember Audric Estime trying to run against an eight-man box just got blown up and you know that didn't go anywhere again like going for it is not the bad decision it, it, it seemed like he did a pretty good job along those lines there were again there were no major like whoa what are you doing here you know why are you going for it here or why aren't you going for it here and those kind of situations so I think he did pretty good and, again, was able to adjust and seem to take control of more of those kind of things as the season you know, wore along. So now, as promised, we go to flexibility. <laughs> it's the next standard on Bill Polian's list. He's, and Polian says, first, can he change the nuts and bolts of his program to adjust to circumstances without changing his approach to the fundamentals. Changing your tactical approach is not the same as changing your fundamental approach. Secondly, can he be flexible and take advantage of circumstances or does he buy someone else's program lock, stock, and barrel? So what do you think about how this one worked out for him? You know, this is, to me, how I take this is, you know, is he is he flexible enough to come into a program like Notre Dame and willing to put a stamp on it on being something of his own, or does he kind of fall into what the Notre Dame tradition is, what the Notre Dame standard is and those sort of things. And I thought he's been in, a, a, extremely flexible in the fact that he's not making excuses for the type of players that can play at the university of Notre Dame. I think that he wants to change kind of, you know, the excuses or these kind of standards of, well, you know, academically we need these things and so you can't get enough out of these guys athletically and, you know, blah, 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 blah. I think he's doing enough of keeping, you know, some of these really good fundamentals, but then also tweaking areas that Notre Dame has lacked in or maybe has limited them from taking that next step, you know, as a program over the last 20 to 30 years. And so I commend him on that of he is going to take – the, the base of it, you know, he's going to take a big base of it and then he's going to kind of add in his own layers and, and make it into what he wants it to be and be flexible enough to know that he can make the changes that he needs to make. I hope that all made sense. <laughs> you know, for the most part, it, like I would say he changed the messaging early. You know, like when you talk about flexibility, he changed his messaging early when they lost to Marshall. Going into the season, finish was what they were talking about. That was kind of their mantra, finish. And that was a reference to, you didn't finish, we didn't finish the Fiesta Bowl. So now we've got to finish. Well, finish didn't work out against Ohio State 
and Marshall. And especially, again, after Marshall, the message changed to preparation and execution. And I think it's kind of a slippery slope when you start changing messaging early on. But again, I think that it shows that he's not too rigid and not too stuck in whatever idea he had in his head of what it was supposed to be and how things were supposed to go. When they didn't go right, he was willing to look in and say, okay, we've got to do this differently. And it's it's not just finished. We've got to, we, we've got to make sure play in and play out. We're preparing and we're executing. And it became, again, like, you, you know, you, you, you still have a Stanford in the middle of things and explaining that, I don't know. But, you know, again, like when you look at the way he did things, his focus was less on who made mistakes and why the mistake was made. You know, and it, and it seemed like the Gator Bowl, he was also more involved, more involved on the sidelines during the game than earlier in the season. And I think, again, like as the season went on and he gets more – gets more games under his belt and really play to play, you know, in 40 second intervals out there on the sideline, we saw him begin to adapt. And, and so I, I think we saw a lot of flexibility from him from start to finish over the course of the season, just the way he did things. How about ability to judge talent? He's Polian said, He's got to be able to see potential rather than just saying this is college player A and this is college player B. He's got to be able to see what potential college player A versus college player B is. Now, again, Bill Polian, of course, was talking about hiring NFL head coaches, um, you know, as opposed. So he's talking about draft evaluation here, whereas, of course, with Marcus Freeman, he's a college head coach. So it's really about recruiting. And I mean, flying colors, really. He ends up with the number nine class in the nation with 24 star guys and go back and look, there aren't any classes in recent Notre Dame history with 24 star guys in the class. And he's already got six, four star guys committed to the 2024 class. And of course, some people would argue that what, you know, a couple of those four stars in the incoming class should have been five stars as well. So, I mean, that is, there's no reason to, you know, even debate this. <laughs> I think his ability to evaluate talent and attract talent is very high. Yeah. And I think that you, that there's really not much more to say about this because he does knock recruiting out of the ballpark in, in such a, in, in the fashion that he does. But I will say another thing that I think adds to this is the ability to judge talent, you know, throughout the season. And I think that at times people were maybe a little frustrated, 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 uh, and, and because they wanted to see, you know, guys like Prince Kali play or Jalen Sneed play or, you know, et cetera, because of their talent, maybe compared to the other, other players. But there's, there's such thing as talent outside of just physical ability talent. There's mental talent. There's, mm -hmm. you know, knowing, knowing the game talent, those sort of things. And I think that that's an underappreciated aspect to, I think Marcus Freeman is, even though that some guys may, you know, talent is an, is a, is a com composite score in my, in my eyes. It's not just all about what you can do physically. And so I think that Marcus Freeman did a good job of taking players overall composite talent scores rather than maybe just looking at the physical gifts that some of these players might have. Yeah, and Tommy's saying how many 24, 24 star guys? Is that what I said? I don't know. Like he has six four star guys for the 2024 class committed, according to what I've seen. So that's that's what I was referring to. And I don't know if you were just joking or what, but <laughs> public relations. We're almost there. We've got three more standards to go in Bill Polian's eleven standards for hiring a head coach. And Really, Pullian says it boils down to can he handle himself when he's in the media maelstrom, you know, that he's forced to endure these days. And again, this comes with like how he stood up after losing to Marshall, how he stood up after losing to Stanford. And, you know, it, it this kind of goes to some of the earlier points we were talking about. I think it was with emotional stability and how he might react but the, the questions obviously get obviously get tougher when you lose games especially games that you're not supposed to lose like Marshall 
and Stanford. But, you know, he didn't he didn't stand up there and beat around the bush. And again, he didn't point fingers. He, you know, he was he was, you know, not blaming players. He was not blaming assistant coaches. Now, I think, you know, maybe again, like there are times I think that that there are people who, you know, would would like him <laughs> to lay blame at, at an assistant coach. But again, a good leader is not going to do that. He's going to accept the blame himself publicly and then handle whatever needs to be handled behind closed doors with the appropriate person. And, you know, like when you look at the fact that the coordinators were available to the media all season Man, long. Man, you're we got... taking my juice. <laughs> go ahead. I'll let you jump in <laughs> right now. You're yeah, I mean, ramble if I go on. Go ahead. <laughs> well, we talked to we talked about it a little bit earlier, and because these things kind of you know bleed into each other a little bit. But Marcus Freeman is tremendous about getting up to the podium and just answering all the questions, tough ones, easy one, hard ones. After the big wins, after the you know the hurtful losses, after you know the 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 decisions to maybe start this guy or go with this guy and so this guy he owns up to all of it and I think that the cherry on top to this one is what you were just about to get into is not only does he do you know the prerequisites but he also goes above and beyond and kind of gives more of his time to the media and gives more of his coordinators time to the media um, so that there can be transparency and there can be honesty and you know people can know what's going on there's no hidden doors there's no you know secrets or anything like that so I think this is another one that he just knocks out of the park. Yeah, I completely agree. Completely agree. Standard number 10 is player respect. Is his approach to discipline fair? Do his personal uh, bearing, conduct, and dignity, which encompasses worth, ethic, temperament, personal habits, et cetera, generate respect from the players? Not liking, but respect. And it seems like it does. But again, like this is something like – I think that you would you would have been hearing a lot like the fact that he was able to hold it together and keep things together after the Stanford loss, after you know the third loss of the season, turn around a couple weeks later and beat Stanford and you know be competitive, have every opportunity going into that USC game. Like the the way the way he held the season together after there was every reason for it to completely unravel for a first year. Head coach, I think I've got to look at that and and put a positive check mark next to this. Yeah, and another thing that I think of, or kind of the first thing that immediately came to mind when I saw this one was uh, from the, the the Michael Jordan documentary. And I know it's different because Jordan was a player amongst players, but to me, I think the concept still is, still holds true. I don't think Marcus Freeman asked anything of his players that he once has you know hasn't had to do himself. Or quite honestly, I, I think Marcus Freeman, if, if you asked him to, he would get in there and still do it with his players. I think he'd run sprints with them. I think he'd put on the pads with them. I, I don't think that there would be anything, you know, that Marcus Freeman would ask of his team, his players, that he hasn't been asked of before or he wouldn't potentially still do, you know, himself these days. And I think that's yeah. a big attribute to him. And I think that's what there's a reason why after just one season, so many of these players – were behind him and behind his back of wanting, you know, him to be the head coach. You had guys like Isaiah Foskey stay, you know, another season because he wanted to play for Marcus Freeman. I think that shows the level of respect that these players have uh, for him. And again, it's just, he's, he's going to be the first, like imagine going into war, um, old, old war, you know, back in the day where guys would just literally get in lines I would put I would say that Marcus Stream would be that first line and he'd put everyone else behind him um in, in this analogy. I think that he's always going to be the guy to be up front and, and leading the charge um and, and always, you know, you know, be there for his players, essentially. And I think that that goes a long way for the respect that they have for him. Yeah. I mean, the root of why he's the Notre Dame football coach is the relationships that he has with the players and and everyone around him on the team and the staff and 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 everyone else. It's all built on that. So great point there. Um, Last one, character. And Bill Polian said, it boils down to one thing. Do you want this man as a standard bearer from for your franchise? And I think after year one, with everything that we've just talked about, there's no reason to say no. It's, it's again, it's a pretty resounding yes for me. What about you? 
Yeah, it's it's definitely a, a big time yes for me. And the reason why is I, I would be comfortable with someone like Marcus Freeman being head coach at Notre Dame for, you know, years on years to go. And I know that he went eight and four this season. And obviously at the end of the day, what matters most is winning. And is he going to be able to have a better year next year and pick up more of those wins? But I mean, when we're talking about character, I don't think that there's there that that there's anyone really better than Marcus Freeman. I, I I honestly could say that, you know, I don't know every head coach in America, but I'd be willing to put good money on it that character wise. He's top five. He doesn't deal with, you know, people doing stupid things. He doesn't deal with his players doing stupid things. He hel- holds them to high standards as men, as, you know, in the classroom, on the football field. And that's because that's the life that he lives outside of football. You know, these things translate over. And so and when you think of Marcus Freeman, I, I think of him as being one of the most high character people, coaches right. that I've seen in a long time. It's just he's he holds everyone to the same standard that he holds himself to. Right. Omar is gone, at least for now. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't paying close enough attention to what Omar was was talking about there for a while. I well, saw it's, just, it's just annoying because trying. why why do you come into a chat just to stir the pot and stir the trouble? You know what you're doing. Right. Right. All right. Well, good stuff. Again, we did that last summer. And we kind of tried to predict and, you know, like feel our way through what things could look like for Marcus Freeman. But now, you know, we've got a a full season of him as head coach. So I think we have a lot better idea. And when you look at those 11 points, I, I, you know, like if you were going to go scale of one to 10 on each of those 11 points, I think, you know, like there might be a seven in there. But otherwise, I I think you're talking about eights, nines and tens on most of them, don't you? Yeah, when you as soon as you said one through ten, I was like, I don't think many of these dipped below seven. I can't think of anywhere I'd be like, man, that's a hard six. Um, but I, I would say, yeah, predominantly you stay between the eight, nine, and ten areas, and the the seven areas like those those C ranges where it's average, but you need him to be above average, and those are the things that he needs to work on going on going into year two. Yeah, and again, having a season to be able to self reflect and and look back. He's he's already shown that he's the kind of guy that he's going to work on his own weaknesses and and get better at them next year. So with that, Jesse, are you ready for rapid fire? Yes, I am ready for rapid fire. You know what? Today I came with my own question. I was tired of you kicking kicking all the questions off. It's my turn to lead the charge this week. So question I I saw uh, based on what I saw the other day, I, I saw the tweet from Dara Mabry. And I saw that, you know, she tore her ACL and she's most more than likely, I mean, not more than likely, she is done for the year. So my question for you is how does Dara Mabry's career ending knee injury impact the, the women's team going forward? And then I had a, a, another question. I got to remind you, it's Dara. Got to remind you, it's Dara, first of all. Don't, Sorry. you know, like. <laughs> how does Dara Mabry's career ending knee injury impact the Irish women going forward? And another thing okay. I wanted to add on to it. Does this adding the midseason uh, early enrollee seem much bigger now that, that, that an injury like this occurred? Well, I do because she's obviously going to be gone now. And so that in terms of the guards, like Neil Ivy was able to run out a lot of different looks and a lot of different lineups and, you know, mixing and matching and, and stuff like that. I would lean toward – the, the freshman KK Bransford is probably going to be in the starting lineup now. Now, a little bit more athletic, not near the three-point shooter that Dara is. Like, Dara had 33 threes, I believe it was, this season. Bransford is one for seven, so you're not going to get that. But she's quick and athletic. You know, she'll show up at the defensive end of the floor. And, you know, like Sonia Citron, who's one of Dara's best friends, actually, on the team as well, she made 18 three-pointers in the first 17 games of the season. She made six the other night and actually hit her first six after Mabry's injury. So I think that she is fully capable of being able to step up and, and start shooting with some more volume, like, you know, and, and, you know, just like more see her starting to take more shots. And so like when you, 
the one thing I wonder, like when you add a Bransford who is not going to be a three-point shooter, with Dara Mabry, just her threat of the three-point shot provided more spacing. The way you had to play defenders, like, you know, they can play off K.K. Bransford a little bit more, like they couldn't play off Dara Mabry. So that's going to change some things, I think. But again, like if Citron can emerge into being a more volume three-point shooter, I think that that helps a lot. And you brought up Kassan Prosper, and, you know, she's probably going to have to accelerate her development right now because the only other guards besides the two I just mentioned are the backup point guard, Jenna Brown, and, of course, the point guard, Olivia Miles. So the guard rotation is a lot shorter now, and Prosper is a guard, but she's also six foot two, and she can shoot the three. A little bit. I think the big thing for her, you know, where she can really show up is at the defensive end of the floor. You're just going to get so much more length out there with a six foot two frame and her wingspan is just nuts. So I think that Cass Prosper's development is going to have to accelerate now and we'll see what that looks like because you can still see her kind of feeling her way through some things out there when she's out on the floor. But I think you're going to have they're going to have to see more of her now and again especially from a defensive aspect that can be a really good thing all right so let me throw you some questions <laughs> last night we did offense tonight we're going to look at the notre dame defense with the idea of buy low and sell high which notre dame defensive player would you buy stock in right now if you wanted that stock to make you the biggest profit a year from now so you're telling me like what's a pen, what what's 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 a penny stock right now, and what's what's what could potentially land you on that Fortune 500 uh, next season? I, the sure. way I look at this is like the easy answer to me is someone like Prince Colley, right? Because it's like you, but to me, he's not a penny stock. He's not a guy who's like everyone knows like, about like, him. Where is his stock right now? Yeah, yeah, like like how relative? Like like yeah, I get what you're saying. So to me, this this came down to to two guys, um, and ultimately, I think both of them are going to end up playing the same position, even though they don't play the same position right now. Um, one is going to be Jordan Patello. Um, I think that he is kind of low stock potential for big boom, high reward going into next season. Um, and another guy, who again, I, I don't think he's going to be playing maybe the same position anymore. But uh, it, I'm going to butcher the last name, Junior. Uh, Tui Alamaka. I think, help, that, yeah. <laughs> I think that he's a guy that potentially shifts down to Viper just because of his, and I'm not calling him fat or slow, but he's, he's a little bigger. <laughs> and I think that Viper could help him be, you don't need to be blazing fast to play Viper. And so right. I think he has a lot of athleticism and side to side agility that would be very beneficial um, at the Viper position. So those are going to be my two guys who, you know, low kind of. And again, I know Junior is a high recruit and, you know, those sort of things and got some time this year as a freshman. But those I, I, I think that the Viper position is going to be that big position next season. And I think that's where you're going to find who's going to be that guy that's kind of under everyone's radar right now and going to pop uh, next season. And those are my two guys, Jordan Patello and Junior. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the biggest questions because you've got to play replace two guys on that side, both Foskey, your starter, and your number two guy, Adam Alola. So you've got to have someone step up there. And Jordan Patello was one of the first people I was thinking about as well. And I saw Xavier Watts brought up. And again, like, relative like where is his stock right now you know like you know again like if you're gonna go one to ten like where is Xavier Watts stock because it already took a little bit of a bump because we started to see him play a little bit more at the end of the season so I, I I would still put him in that mix though I think he's a good one because he wasn't a consistent like he wasn't in the starting lineup it 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 took him the season to develop to get where he is I think that there's still a ton of upside with him. So I like him as well. And this is the other one that I like a lot that Tommy pointed out, and that's Jalen Sneed. And now jumping too high, you know, on Sneed already. I know everybody loves Sneed. So, you know, so again, like you could make the argument 
is his stock low enough, you know, like you said, in that penny range to where you're going to get full value when it's all said and done, if he comes close to reaching his potential. But if he's able to get over there at Rover and then you're playing, you know, a couple of those other guys inside more and Jalen Sneed is able to, you know, to give you some, you know, like Nickel is, is a potential question, even though you have the Oklahoma State guy coming in, you know, like, that's a potential spot for him. We think it's a, a fairly natural spot for him. But I, Batella would be my one. Jalen Sneed would be my number two. And I do like Xavier Watts. He would be my third one as well. So I, I think that, that, uh, that you know, this spring is going to be really big for Jalen Sneed just in terms of development and seeing how much more he can sort of absorb because there's no doubt that he's got talent. How quickly can he put it together? And be a guy who can go out, who that they can they can count on, and be uh, you know go out there and produce on Saturdays next fall. Interesting question here. Notre Dame football is recruiting a guy named Daniel Freitag. He's a wide receiver who also wants to play basketball in college. Now it's not like like it's it's not necessarily a deal breaker for him, I guess, if he can't play basketball but he's interested in playing both football and basketball if he can so what are your thoughts on letting a player play both of those sports potentially in college if you're recruiting him you know i I don't know the last time i've seen a football and basketball combination i've you know you predominantly kind of see especially you know at notre dame the the football and baseball track you know jeff samarja golden tate um, oh, what was the guy that played outfield for Notre Dame and also wide receiver? Uh, he was a junior. Um, Torrey Hunter. Torrey Hunter Jr., exactly. That's who I was thinking of. Um, it's a lot easier when you can do it because those seasons, one's in the fall and one's in the spring. Um, I, what would make it hard about basketball is, you know, basically when the, the, the school semester starts – even though basketball isn't, you know, maybe having full organized practices, they're still doing, you know, team shoot around scrimmages, you know, whatever it might be. And then you start well, basketball, up. like they start practicing in October and the season starts in November when the football right. season. And that's going. obviously yeah. in the heart of the football season. And so how do you balance those things and get good quality time on both ends? And it's even harder for me because I, I didn't have, I didn't play basketball. Right. Like I never that was never really an issue for me. I I was lucky enough, not lucky enough, but I I I did it in a way where, you know, I focused all my attention mainly to football in the fall. And then as soon as, you know, that ended, it was baseball through the winter and then obviously into the spring. And so for me, I don't have an issue with it as long as, again, you're getting both quality. you're, You're putting in quality time on both ends and it's not affecting either side of the coin. And I think the best example of this on, on seasons that potentially overlap is when Pat Connington did basketball and played baseball, because there obviously yeah. had to be some sort of conflict and it obviously worked out for him because I mean, the guy got drafted in both leagues. So I think if Pat Connington could get it done, I think it might be a little bit harder for football, basketball, but I definitely think it could still get done. I think football, basketball in college has got to be the toughest because even like with Connington, like you're talking about basketball ends sometime in March, unless you go to the national championship game, then it's early April. But, you know, so that's, that's like the first month and a half of your baseball season, but he could like Connaughton because he was a pitcher and not a hitter, he could still get over, throw a bullpen session once or twice a week, you know, even though he wasn't with the team and, and, you know, like I remember the NCAA tournament ended one year and he bolted straight back to town. And I think he went downtown to what was then Kovaleski now four wins field to, to pitch, you know, for Notre Dame in in a in a night game so i think it's a little bit you know you're gonna miss some with basketball what makes it so tough is again like you're going to miss a, especially if you end up in a bowl game or or if you're in the college football play if you're gonna miss a good two months of the season and what about your off-season work as well where like the football players are doing conditioning during the summer and it's all team conditioning and stuff like that and well the basketball team is doing stuff as well. So it's there's definitely got to be an openness and a willingness 
by both head coaches. And a lot of times coaches will say, yeah, sure, we'll let you do it. But then once push starts <laughs> coming to shove, I think guys get start getting a little bit more territorial. But it's been done before, like Charlie Ward at Florida State. I, I realized this was before your time, but you know Charlie won a Heisman Trophy on the football field, and then he went to play in the NBA with the New York Knicks after that. Like Tony Gonzalez did both at Cal, and Julius Peppers did both at North Carolina. And those are like the higher profile type guys, but it has been done before. So it's not like it's never been done. It's, it's, it's about the willingness, I think of, of the coaches and how much they think he can contribute because, you know, again, it's, it's going to start not only cutting into your regular season, but it'll cut into your off seasons as well. It, you know, when, when you're talking about developing and getting ready for the next season. And that kind of thing. So I, I think it's really interesting. It's it's I don't remember, you know, other guy, another guy popping up like this that was baseball football. You know, like you said, there have been other two sport guys, but it seems like most of them show up in baseball. You know, there's there's a lacrosse guy though as well. So it seems like Marcus Freeman is potentially open to it. So I'll be really curious to see where this goes with Freitag. Yeah, I think it ultimately just boils down to what you were talking about, the willingness of the coaches to be able to work, you know, with each other. And honestly, too, what impact the player has, because if he's a stud on both teams, obviously both teams are going to want him and you're going to be maybe uh, more OK with them missing time here and there because of, you know, the, the impact that you know that they can make once they're, you know, a full time kind of participant. Yeah. Seeing like Chi Town said, the four horsemen played basketball too. But I realized that under Rockney, who coached almost every sport at Notre Dame at one time, yeah, and like a hundred years ago, not you know, it's yeah, around a hundred years ago at this point, you know, things were a little bit, you know, like the seasons, you know, like the college football season even was shorter, and the off season workouts were shorter, and all that kind of stuff. I, so, you know, times were simpler. <laughs> I don't think it was as hard to make these in. And the fact that you did have Rockney coaching other sports, I think definitely helped as well. It was almost like high school now where it's like, come on, come out for the baseball team, even though you haven't played baseball in five years. It's, you know, it's almost like they're begging guys to come out for sports <laughs> back then. So, all right. So Tony Romo has received a lot of criticism recently. He was beaten up on Twitter this weekend for his call, the Bills Bengals game. Some of the, uh, some of the, Notable tweets. He said, that looks like it might have been moving forward, but it also looks like a fumble. I don't know. People calling him out for that. People calling him out for calling the play clock a shot clock. Some people said he should just be muted. And, you know, of course, Jess Romo made his name by predicting plays when he started off as an analyst, but CBS made him tone it down. So I guess my question is, is he as good now as when he started What's it been like five or six years ago now at this point? Yeah, uh, it has been five or six years ago. You, you know, listen, I I never have an issue listening to a Tony Romo game. And it's not because of what everyone's probably going to say. Oh, he was a Dallas Cowboy <laughs> or, you know, any of those sort of things. And I enjoyed Romo, but I just think he's a pure analyst. I think he knows the game. I think he gets excited about the game. I think he teaches you. The game in a way that doesn't make you feel kind of like he's, you know, demeaning you or, or, or talking down to you or, you know, just uh, but I do think at times there are instances where he's just kind of flaunting. Yes, he, he does know probably a little bit more than what he should talk about in certain situations and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I think that it, Tony Romo is just as good now as he, he is as he was when he first started as a, as a TV analyst. I don't think that he's dropped off it by any means. And Again, I, 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 if, if Tony Romo's doing a game, I am never upset. I'm always looking forward to it. I can't say the same about Greg Olson, but uh, <laughs> we'll just have to agree to disagree. <laughs> Jesse hates Greg agree. Olson because he thinks Greg Olson hates his Cowboys. And I'll just say, someone you know, like, agreed with me in the chat when I brought it up. So I know I went, they're not even a Cowboys fan. So I okay. know. All right. This was last week. You're not going to find it today, but there. Right. There are times where he was – I thought he did a great job in that 49ers game. I, I will say that. I thought that okay. that was his best Cowboys game of the year. All right. I'll just say the Romo stuff. I saw a lot of this. I got to see about half the game because I you know, did the women's game, the women's basketball game, and then came home, kind of got some dinner ready and you know, settled in to, uh, you know, to watch the Cowboys-Niners game that night. And, uh, you know, so I had it on. 
But then NFL Network replayed it yesterday. So I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'll see what everyone's talking about. And it's like, okay, he called the play clock the shot clock. It's like the guy watches other said, sports. You know, I feel it's like, like the errors he was the- making is just like you're just talking to try to kind of fill right a void rather than and like I've heard people say, well, he's not as prepared as he used to be. And it's like, see, you know, he's been out of the game for a few years, so he doesn't know as much as he knew because he's already been out of the game. It's like and they were talking about him being unprepared and not, you know, not putting in the work. And like, I've never, I don't, seen I don't that. know how many times I heard him, you know, reference, you know, like where he's talking about different personnel that the two teams, you know, the bills and the Bengals were using. And he would recall conversations that he, you know, he had just had, you know, with the assistant coaches or studying film and all this kind of stuff. I think it's just like everything else, you know, Romo is not new anymore. So he is not the shiny new toy. So he is just like everybody else. So now it's like you start picking him apart and, you know, you know everything else. I, I think Romo is just fine. He does still kind of have to figure himself out a little bit more. Like the dynamic in that booth with, with Nance is a little bit different. Personally, I loved it when he predicted the plays. And I think he could still predict the plays. And it's like, especially in these playoff games, you know, it's like, oh, you know, watch up here. You know, this is, this is going to happen. I think that kind of stuff is great. Maybe it prepares, you know, maybe it. It, it annoys some people, but I had no problem with it. I think it. I think it's one of his assets, and I think they should let him do it more. They shouldn't be stifling him on that. Mm-hmm. All right, we've come to the portion of the show where you know some <laughs> people are waiting for Brent. How about them Cowboys? <laughs> and and of course he wants wants to know if the 49ers defense will shut down Philly's offense. And uh, you know Salty was saying earlier that we were just stalling by uh not getting to the point so let me uh let me ask you this let let me you know i'm gonna save this other one yeah i'm gonna save this other one let's just get in with this ross tucker <laughs> oh says man I, I was hoping for the easy one first the, the night that the, the the biggest you want to go with the other one you want to go with the other one it's the biggest bright spot of the cowboys team okay fill in the blank micah parsons Throwing Mike McGlinchey to the ground like a rag doll during Sunday's playoff game was blank. <laughs> it was textbook. It was exciting. It was just everything that you want to see out of football. And not only did he hip check, you know, McGlinchey and just toss a 315 pound man like it was, you know, breakfast. He he made freaking Kittle whiff before that, uh, and then he tosses. McGlinchy, he gets past two defenders in a span of like two and a half seconds. It felt like, like it. Not only does he just chuck McGlinchy, but he just absolutely destroys Kittle, uh, also an All-Pro, you know, lineman type guy, and just gets to Brock Purdy after what seemed to be instantaneously. So I loved it. Mike Parsons is my favorite player. I could watch his film almost twenty-four-seven. Like there's. That's probably Brian my Baldy favorite loves thing. him. I'll tell you that. Baldy loves that's, him. That's what I was going to say. You know, I, the, and he says it every, every, because I, I look forward to Baldinger's videos on Monday just because I know there's going to be a Micah Parsons one. And I just don't, there's no one in the league like Micah Parsons. I know there's guys that have more sacks than him, but the skill set that Micah Parsons has and the way he disrupt plays without getting sacks, I just, I don't think that there's anyone better in the business right now. And he, he he it's as a guy who played defense and you know someone who enjoys watching defense it's just it is so fun being able to watch him you know i realize you know like i don't watch current pro wrestling so i don't know like any of the names of these current guys i i couldn't tell you who's big who's small and all this but like parsons throwing mike mcglinchy like he did literally like mike mcglinchy was parallel to the ground. <laughs> it's because Micah Parsons had him up. And again, he threw him like it was, it would be like if one of the British Bulldogs body slammed Hulk Hogan back in the day. It's like you're talking about eh, versus, eh, you know, there's there's a big difference. And it was just, it was amazing. And I know, like, of course, everyone later on wanted to talk about how, you know, McGlinchey and Aaron Banks with the big inside double team on McCaffrey's touchdown and all that kind of stuff. But how are you going to do when you've got a pass protect and you've got a man like that coming at you? That was I never would have thought that I would see Mike McGlinchey 
end up in that kind of situation. It was but just I, so smooth, like all one know, motion. It was one like motion. Just, just it was amazing. It, it, I, I see Micah Parsons talking about wrestling all the time. He had to be a wrestler in his day. That's where he had to learn that move. Cause I mean, he just chucked him like it was like literally it was in stride. It didn't look like he broke stride one bit. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, the world famous Scotty Nitro says back in the day, Jerry Faust era, he believes Joe Howard played receiver for football point guard for the basketball team. All right. Point to you, Scotty Nitro. Thanks for, uh, for dropping that knowledge in there. All right. So now the big one. <laughs> <laughs> We don't See where we go with this. this Ross Tucker says he would fire Mike McCarthy and make defensive coordinator Dan Quinn the head coach rather than let Quinn leave to be a head coach somewhere else. So if the Cowboys are going to be fixed, what do you do to fix him? Is this the answer? Is it something else? Where does it need to go? I'll just go over here and smoke a cigarette <laughs> while you've been for a while. <laughs> You know, first and foremost, I just want to say I I appreciated the game on Sunday. I thought it was the best game of Sunday. I didn't come down to how I wanted it to end, obviously. And I, Dak made a lot of mistakes that ultimately could have potentially won them the game if he hit some plays here and there. But, you know, the Cowboys played a better team, a better roster, a better defense, you know, a lot of quarterbacks have struggled against this San Francisco defense. There's a reason why they average, you know, they only give up 15 points per game on this 11 game winning streak. It's hard. They have a great roster. Um, and I'm not trying to take away from Dak because he made mistakes. I think that ultimately getting to the question now, Dan Quinn is the most important piece of this puzzle. Because I think the Cowboys covered a lot of their deficiencies this year by having a very good defense. And then towards the back half of the season, they lost both of their starting corners. They lost a defensive tackle. They lost the middle linebacker. They got some of those guys back, but they were still pretty banged up in the secondary. So for me, I think, and when you have Micah Parsons, I think Dan Quinn builds a defense that only allows Micah Parsons to excel and let him be the star of the defenses, which is how it should be because Mark, Micah Parsons is a top five defensive player in, the, in all of the NFL. So the most important piece to me is keeping Dan Quinn. I don't care if he's the head coach. I don't care if he's a defensive coordinator. He just needs to be on the staff and be compensated. I mean, uh, fairly they found fairly. a way to keep him last year. They kept him from becoming a head coach last year. I don't know if you can do it two years in a row. I will say this, being a good coordinator does not necessarily make you a good head coach. Correct. And you know, you can say that Dan Quinn was a good head coach in Atlanta because he had Matt Pro, uh, Matt Ryan before, you know, it, and Julio Matt Ryan Jones. Prime, you know, before it went backwards. Yeah, he had Julio Jones, but he also had the guy who's calling the shots now in San Francisco, and you know that was a big part of it as well. And after he left, you saw a backstep every year until eventually he was fired as head coach. And even as a defensive-minded head coach. The Atlanta Falcons defense was not good his last couple of years, like really not good. So just keeping him around does not guarantee that the defense is going to be good. You need him as defensive coordinator. If you don't have him, you need somebody else. Personally, I would say this. I don't put it all on Dak. This was his worst year in terms of interceptions, but he also had a pretty good amount of touchdowns for missing four games during the season. I think it's time for... Uh, like to turn the page offensively. Kellen Moore was forced down Mike McCarthy's throat. He had to keep uh, McCarthy. He was the only coach who was kept on from Jason Garrett's staff. I think it's time to turn the page. You 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 don't have a Kyle Shanahan over there who has like a system. There are plays, but there is not a system. What do you hang your hat on? Doug Nussmeyer, the quarterback's coach, his contract is up. You know, maybe that's part of the answer as well. I think that they need something different offensively if you're going to maximize Dak because they're not going to get rid of Dak Prescott. You're going to keep him around. I think that that is uh, is what they have to do. Uh, all right, all right, all right, Michael, bro, leave if you don't want to hear the talk. It's we're at the end of rapid fire. No one's forcing you to stay here. So, 
I think that the biggest fix, of, again, is what you were talking about. It'd be nice to see maybe some some new offensive personnel. And specifically, I thought that, you know, the front office did DACA injustice this season by not getting a solid wide receiver to, you know, Micah Gallup was coming off an of ACL surgery. Um, and I don't think they had a legit wide receiver two all year. So that put a lot of pressure on Lamb and Dak. And then when you lose a guy like Pollard in the first half, who's your, you know, your other offensive playmaker um, on offense, it's going to be tough. And so what, what can Kellen Moore do to scheme up plays that, you know, potentially can get over the deficit of not having a solid wide receiver two, and then now losing a guy like Pollard. So I felt that there were some injustices on that half of they need to get a legit wide receiver too. They need to make Tony Pollard the premier back. They need to restructure Zeke's contract. I, I don't care about all that stuff. Like my, and I get what you're saying. There are things that they need, but you know, like Zeke Elliott, are you going to keep him around at over 10 million bucks a year? He's, you know, he says he's willing to maybe take a pay cut. There, there is enough that you know. Do they need more? Yeah, they need more. But there is enough there. You have they have to figure out after year seven how to maximize Dak Prescott because he's making mistakes that a seven year veteran should not be making for a team with with Super Bowl yeah. aspirations. And that's why I say you've got to change the coaching. You've got to change something on the offensive side. You're not just going to wave a magic wand and make Dak Prescott better so like everyone can talk about oh Dak Prescott's not the guy and you know all this different stuff you've got to figure out how to maximize him and that's why I think it's time to turn the page and, and yeah and I think that's why adding another staff. solid wide receiver around him would help because then you're not asking him to be that guy he's not a Patrick Mahomes or Joe Burrow or that type of quarterback Dak's a solid quarterback but he's not a top five top four top two you know quarterback that that could potentially take over and win you that game so Putting more around him, I think, is definitely an option. And then, you know, in terms of there's, uh, they're, they're going to have a lot of free agents, and I think they need to pick and choose wisely which guys that they bring back because there's certain right. guys that are impactful and there's certain guys that you could live to walk with. Like Donovan Sign Wilson. Me up for an, like T.Y. Hilton at a bargain price for another year. I would love that. Thank you, Derek, by the way, for the super chat, <laughs> for the response. And, uh, you know, Brent. Cowboys actually shut down CMC and Debo. That's what I mean. It was a great game. Won the game. It was. It was a great game. I was thinking it was a great game, but it's like once they got to about that seven-minute mark and you start doing the math, you're a math guy. You had to know how that was going to play out. You know, you know I, I was talking to the, my girlfriend about this last night, and I know she doesn't ultimately care, but I was just kind of venting a little bit. I, saw, I could tell in Dak's eyes – on the sideline that he just wasn't there. He was, he was flustered. And I've seen the look in his eyes before where he wants it and he knows that he's going to go get it and he's going to lead his team. I just didn't see that look in his eyes and I was afraid, but I didn't want, I didn't, I, I was just like, you know what? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, you know, things are going to turn a different way, but he just never looked like he had that, that fire, you know, in his eyes. i never felt like he, he had that, that drive to take it over. Like I've seen him in the past where he's in the huddle, you know, getting on everyone, giving everyone fist pumps all around the Like, I don't know. I just didn't see it in his eyes. They just, they flustered him all night. And you could tell there's different schemes that they were running, you know, on, on defense, they were disguising, they were confusing him. You know, someone brought up that T Y Hilton touchdown and it's like, yeah, it's easy to say now, but on film when a guy breaks open, but that's, they baited him into the throw. That's where they wanted him to throw that ball. Well, Michael says, if you're saying that now there's way more talent, but he's not hitting open playmakers, I don't think that that's what anyone said. I, no. I'm not saying there's way more talent. They obviously got rid of Amari Cooper last offseason because of money. But like I sent, you know, like Dan Orlovsky was doing a breakdown yesterday and there was a, you know, like Dak loves that that deep middle or, you know, not just deep middle, but middle of the field. That's where he's had most of his problems. And like there was a specific play where – you know, he takes the deep shot to C.D. Lamb down the middle of the field. If he would have just looked to his left, he would have had probably a touchdown, if not at least a 35, 40-yard gain to a wide-open T.Y. Hilton who had great position, but he just never looked in that direction. And that's, you know, kind of like with with um, Drew Pine this year. It's like there's more to the field than just that one guy. You've got to see the whole field and actually go through your – progressions and 
Hey, thanks, Michael. I'm a big Drew Pearson fan too, myself. But um, yeah, yeah. So you know, again, it's like it's it's not all on Dak Prescott, but I think that the way the team is constructed, they're never going to go out in a big free agent frenzy. You know, like I would love if they drafted Michael Mayer. <laughs> like that would fix a lot of things. I think next year because they're not going to pay Dalton Schultz. I don't think to stick around. So I would love they Michael should've. Mayer to end up down there. That would be perfect. And Jules was asking about a slot receiver, their system, you know, again, like the current system they're in, they don't use the slot receiver enough. Like they had Cole Beasley and he was, you know, Cole Beasley went to Buffalo and became much more of a factor in that Buffalo offense than he was when he was in Dallas. So uh, Craig, my weekend was made seeing Buffalo lose another year. No Super Bowl. Go Dolphins still undefeated. And again, we were talking about this at the start of the show. The real story coming out of this weekend is the Buffalo Bills for the last couple of years have been a preseason Super Bowl favorite. And Josh Allen has not gotten out of this divisional round of the playoffs the last two years. That's, to me, a much bigger story yeah, like than Dak and Dallas losing a very competitive game. Like They were much more competitive against the 49ers than the Bills were against Cincinnati on their home, home field. As, yes. the, as the favorite. And that's that's the crazy part. Ask anyone in, listening right now or in the chat, who's a better quarterback, Josh Allen or Dak Prescott? Everyone will say Josh Allen. So why isn't Josh Allen getting the same criticism that Dak Prescott is getting for playing probably – in my opinion, just as worse um, of a game. So, and then another aspect uh, that is kind of crazy, in my opinion, is you know the <laughs> the Buffalo Bill. The same round as the Dallas Cowboys. So, it, it's just kind of all to me um, hypocritical because. The, the Bills have a better quarterback. They went out in the offseason and made moves to be a team that wanted to make it to the next step and go to the Super Bowl, yet they lost worse on their home field than the Cowboys did. But, yeah. you know, that's – Like Brent, Brent says CD played the slot. Well, he played all year. He's a slot – he's basically a slot receiver. That's what – he's the best. Right. Coming out and of the what slot. what I meant is, is like that, that pure slot type guy where you can move CD to the outside. I guess that's kind of what I'm talking about. Michael Campbell is being a guy that I, I just had to deal with all the week so far. <laughs> well, you know, and again, I'm not making excuses for Dak. Dak is the thing that's got to get fixed if they if they want to be. I was talking at the one at the bottom too. <laughs> well, Lost to had... Mister Irrelevant. Yeah, but the the 49ers have the best roster and the best probably you know overall one of the best overall coaches. You know, anyone that steps in and plays quarterback in that system is going to be good. And defense. Let's not right. forget and the defense. And they have the best def they have the best overall roster. You know. So it didn't it didn't come down to was Dak better than Brock. Brock just had to do enough with the game plan that was given to him. And so yeah. I don't think that that's an apples to apples comparison. And that's another point that I've been trying to dispute this week. I have right. excuse me. I have the worst friends. I have the worst group chats that I'm in because <laughs> it, there's nothing better than everyone pooping on a Cowboys fan parade after a loss. Okay, last question tonight. Was Dalton Schultz's play on the Cowboys' last drive when he didn't get the foot down worse than Dak's scramble at the end of last year's loss to the 49ers? Yeah, I, I do think so because all, I think both plays were worse. The fact that he didn't – No, you got to tell – one's got to be worse than the other. No, I'm talking Two about – Two cannot be worse. One, one, by definition, has to be worse than the other or or they're equal. I'm saying that that uh, that both of Dalton's plays, back to back plays. Oh, the, I got you. I got the you. The one where he didn't. Get Look, you and I, you and I have no love for corner. Dalton Schultz. No love for Dalton Schultz. So again, bring me Michael Mayer, baby. I'm just like I'm gonna rub my sticks together for the next three months. <laughs> bring me Michael Mayer to Dallas. Get Dalton Schultz. I've seen Schultz some mocks where he's uh, been down there. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's Dalton Schultz. One needs to know, dude. You got all that space. Get both feet in. And two, he knows he needs to get forward progression going out of bounds. Those are two, just like come on, plays. And your boy Greg back. Olson, who played tight end, is like you got to muscle up a little bit 
You know, that's you gotta you gotta get yourself going that's forward. The reason you know why you've got to be going forward. That's yeah. the reason why Schultz is worth this. He's not physical. He just wants to go out there and catch passes. He doesn't do anything in the run game. Right. He doesn't do anything to lower his shoulder. He just wants to be a pretty boy and line up and catch passes all day. That's exactly it. Yeah, you're exactly right. And I had forgotten about the one where you know he didn't get going forward and get out of bounds. But it, yeah, that's two plays on the final drive that just kill you. They absolutely, you know. And then people want to bag on him for that last play with Zeke snapping <laughs> the ball and stuff like that. It's like it's gonna be Did a you desperation really think play. It was gonna be a play that was gonna score. Like, come on, right, right. Don't show. Like, get your foot down. How how. How hard is that? Because he was like, what, at least three or four yards from the sideline. You got to get that foot. You got you got to drag that foot. You got to get going forward, both of them. Just inexcusable. And again, Dak has his share of the blame, and it is completely earned. And I said this last night when you weren't here, but, you know, I, I disparaged Dak to you, you know, in some texts, and I didn't hear from you afterwards on Sunday. I'm, you know, I, I'm at my limit with Dak. And the point is, he's got a big contract. You're paying him all that money. He ain't going nowhere. They're not just going to get rid of Dak. So if you're not going to get rid of Dak, you've got to do something that makes him better. And it starts, quarterback coach is a simple solution, but offensive coordinator, a system, an actual system, Shanahan has a system, you know, like I'd like the the Eagles have a system. I would like to see a system. That's what I would go with if you're going to make Dak Prescott better. Dak is not tradable. He doesn't have uh, the, the, their best option is to actually kind of restructure his contract, sort of like what a Patrick Mahomes contract. Yeah, no one's going to take on that money. That's <laughs> and you're not salary. cutting them. You know, the Cowboys. Are, that's part of the Cowboys problem is the salary gap. You know, because of what they paid him and overpaying Zeke Elliott. I really want Zeke gone more than anybody, but I don't even know if that'll happen. I don't know. Jesse, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up on that. I promised that we would get all of the Cowboys grousing out of the way tonight. There's no more Cowboys so, till next season. This is it. Right. This is the purge. <laughs> that's right. And, you know, try to mix some other teams in there when we talk about it as well by point of comparison. But. Never going to please everybody. Congratulations to all 49ers fans. You have an excellent team. It was a fun game to watch. Unfortunately, yeah. my team just didn't win in the end. Yeah. My Super Bowl pick is still intact. I've got the Niners and Bengals. They're both still playing this weekend. And, you know, should be, you know, hopefully a couple of great games. I don't know. We'll talk more about them on Friday when we do our Friday rapid fire going into the weekend. Jesse, great stuff as always. Everyone else, appreciate you being here tonight. Appreciate your thoughts for Henry, who's still chilling on that couch back there. He's behind sleeping. Jesse and has not been yapping tonight. Hit the like button if you would on your way out. We've got the mailbag show coming up tomorrow. Vince and I will be here for that. So we will talk to you then on Ivy Nation Sports Talk.